Um, so my name is Michal or Harry, whichever you prefer, and uh, I have a, both a personal and a professional interest in sleep, and it's now my role in the next 15 minutes or so to persuade you why sleep is important in Parkinson's disease, uh, and particularly why we're interested in what Michelle and Max already mentioned, a condition called REM sleep behaviour disorder, and why we think that could lead to one of the, some of the biggest breakthroughs in uh, Parkinson's research. So what is REM sleep? Well, it's, uh, it's here in blue, and it's what happens between you being awake and you being in deep sleep. And REM sleep, people tend to know they're in REM sleep because if you wake up during REM sleep, it's when you remember your dreams. It's when the vivid dreams happen. And what happens in the brain is that you have two pathways that go from your brain into your spinal cord to paralyze you to make sure you don't act out your dreams and you have a nice and settled, uh, settled sleep. And that's, those pathways is what goes wrong in REM sleep behavior disorder. Now, the concept of sleep in Parkinson's is really not new. So you may or may not know, the first six cases of Parkinson's disease were, were described by Parkinson's almost 200 years ago. And even then, he noted that there's problems of sleep become disturbed, there's tremulous motion of the limbs, and patients often awaken with agitation and alarm. And nothing really happened for a long time until Mr. Disney in 1950 released Cinderella part one. And this is Bruno, uh, who is Cinderella's dog, and he's acting out his dreams. He's, he's asleep, he's probably during his REM sleep stage of sleep and he's acting it out. What's really interesting is this is 10 years before RBD was, so when I say RBD, that's REM sleep behavior disorder, it's too long for me to say. Uh, it's when, so it's 10 years before RBD was, was described. And then we had to wait another 36 years before we uh, discovered that this actually happens in, in humans. So this is a gentleman with a very severe form of REM sleep behavior disorder. He's dreaming that he's, he's fighting. He acts out this, this dream. It's dangerous, they can, he can hurt himself, he can uh, hurt his bed partner. But why, were we, why are we interested in RBD and Parkinson's disease? This is something that you might have seen before, and it's just a graph of the <coughs> neurons, the dopaminergic neurons, which, which uh, Claudia talked about. And as you develop Parkinson's, those neurons die off. But what's interesting, that if you look at the symptoms of Parkinson's, they happen quite late on. And you, depending what you read, what experiments you use, you're probably talking about 10 or 15 years of these neurons dying off before symptoms of Parkinson's uh, emerge, and diagnosis only happens at this stage. Now, what my research and what a lot of our research is about is trying to diagnose Parkinson's in this phase. Because here we've got lots of healthy neurons, and introducing any treatments at that point may stop people progressing to Parkinson's, may have a much bigger impact on people's lives. Now, for a very long time, and we're even talking, you know, five, six, seven years ago, we call this period the pre-symptomatic or the non-symptom uh, phase. But we know that's not true because it's, it's full of symptoms, but they're rather non-specific. So people may lose their smell, may become constipated, but may also develop this condition, REM sleep behavior disorder. So why, why interest in, in REM sleep behavior disorder and not these and many other symptoms? Well, if you take 100 people with constipation, <coughs> probably around three of them will develop Parkinson's within 10 or 15 years. If you take 100 people with loss of smell, maybe five will develop Parkinson's. But if you take people with REM sleep behavior disorder, around 80 will develop Parkinson's disease. This is a staggering number. I must say it's based on a few, relatively few small trials, but whatever this number is, it's considerably higher than any of the symptoms put together. So we need to concentrate on this condition. 
And the two main questions are, REM sleep behavior disorder is rare. So do the people who have REM sleep behavior disorder and then develop Parkinson's, are they represented over this normal or typical Parkinson's? Do they represent everyone else with Parkinson's? And if so, can we exploit the relationship to find new ways of diagnosing and, and or treating people in this early or what we call prodromal stage? So in order to, to try to answer that question, um, uh, the group of us that have started seeing people with REM sleep behavior disorder, some of uh, ho who come from the Oxford Sleep Clinic, some of whom come from the Papworth Clinic, and actually now soon we will start going to Sheffield as well to try to get as many people with, um, with RBD. And when, when I see them in these clinics, well, they go through what everyone else who's taken part here has gone through. They have the same examinations, which means we can directly compare people with RBD people with Parkinson's disease and healthy controls. Well, so ha what have we found out so far? Unsurprisingly, even though um, I can't diagnose these people with, with Parkinson's disease, there is evidence of subtle motor signs of Parkinson's disease. So they may have a slight of tremor. They may be a little bit stiff. It's not, there, uh, it's not bad enough for the diagnosis to be made, but there is some suggestion that there, there are some abnormalities. What's even more important is that people with RBD are 1.6 times more likely to have some memory problems, two or three times more likely to develop either depression or anxiety, be almost two times uh, likely to have lost their smell, and 1.8 times more likely than, than people without Parkinson's or RBD to have constipations. What's important about this is that if you look at these symptoms, what we call non-motor symptoms that Fad will talk about, you can't distinguish people with RBD from people with Parkinson's disease. So all the things that are happening in Parkinson's are also happening in RBD. Well, uh, a lot of the work uh, has been happening for a long time to try to diagnose people with early Parkinson's, and a lot of this work has focused on, on rare, well, reasonably rare genetic uh, mutations that may cause Parkinson's disease. So we have this new model of, uh, or this new group that are at risk of develop par <coughs> developing Parkinson's. And are they, b is this group better uh, at defining kind of typical Parkinson's disease than these genetic mutations? And to do that, we have to dig a little bit harder. So one of the things that we've done, uh, collaborating with uh, Professor Masood Hussein, who works with memory, is to develop a test. And it's a very simple test where you have, where our patient is, sees four different colored bars at different directions that disappear <coughs> and then one of those bars comes back and you have to remember where it was before. It's a very simple test but there's a lot of analysis that can happen and there's three kind of errors that you can, uh, you can make. You can just get it a little bit wrong, you can completely forget where the bar was and make a complete guess or you can get a little bit confused and instead of remembering where the red one was, point to the, where the green or the blue one was. And what's important, that if you have a gene mutation that leads to Parkinson's disease, you have a very specific pattern of these abnormalities in this <coughs> test. But if you have RBD, you will behave almost identically to people with, with, with established Parkinson's, which means that people with RBD who develop Parkinson's are probably just normal, typical Parkinson's disease. So can we use this information to then develop tests that will al allow us early diagnosis? And there's lots of work being done on this in Oxford and elsewhere, but my own personal interest is to do with MRI. And when I started work, I knew very little about uh, MRI, so this is my kind of understanding. So when you have structural MRI, we're just interested in the way that your brain looks. And what we know that if you take a group of people with early Parkinson's and if you take a group of uh, people who don't have Parkinson's, we can, if we look really, really hard, we can start to identify small changes. But those changes are not significant enough that if I scan one person, it will tell me whether they have Parkinson's or not or whether they will develop Parkinson's. So for, for that reason, we used to functional MRI. And as Michelle already said, what happens is you come and you see me in Oxford and you put into the scanner for six minutes, eyes open, try to relax. And during those six minutes, 
we divide the brain into lots and lots of little cubes and we look how those cubes communicate to one another. And you end up with something that looks like this. <laughs> so you get a huge network of, of these connections. But what we can do is then, you know, look at the central line. Just look at one of the lines within the tube network. And now our central line is the basal ganglia network. So this is the part of the brain that Claudia talked about. So these parts of the brain are critical to Parkinson's disease. Damage to these parts of the brain is what gives the motor problems. And as Michelle already showed, that if you take people with early Parkinson's disease and people with, uh, with, uh, who don't have Parkinson's disease, there's a lot of changes in this network. And what's amazing about this, it, that you can take it from a <laughs> picture that shows group differences to actually each of these circles, squares, or triangles being a, a patient or a subject. And like Michelle so, uh, said, we can start using these tests to differentiate. So only using the scan, we've got a fairly good idea of saying whether someone's got Parkinson's, Parkinson's or not. But actually, our, uh, this differentiation is not as good as, for example, when, when someone sees Dr. Dr. Who, who can tell you with a much better <laughs> accuracy whether you do or don't have Parkinson's disease. But the reason why this is important because we can start looking at people who don't have any of the symptoms of Parkinson's but may get in the future. And this is what I do. And so this is, this is the, the representation. So these are people with REM sleep behavior disorder who are at risk of developing Parkinson's disease and comparing them to healthy controls. And they have, even though they don't have any of the motor symptoms that can lead to the diagnosis of Parkinson's, they have significant challenges throughout the basal ganglia network. And as before, we can give them a, s a score and separate them from healthy controls. So that's interesting in itself. But the question is, well, can how can we use this? One of the things is we can try to expand this to the general population. We can take you know, people over 60 who are, might have lost their smell, may have lost their um, uh, may be constipated and try to de uh, develop a, a way of saying what is the risk of developing Parkinson's. Also, we can take these people who have a very low score compared to people without Parkinson's and say, well, are these people who are <coughs> at highest risk of developing Parkinson's, are these the people that will develop Parkinson's in the next three or five years, and are these the people that we should be trying new medications on to try to slow down the conversion or stop them from developing Parkinson's. The converse is also true. So this person who's got a really high score, is he like Bruno? So this is Bruno in Cinderella 2, which was released 52 years after the in initial Cinderella. He doesn't have Parkinson's. <laughs> I've watched the whole film, so I can tell you, he doesn't have Parkinson's. <laughs> so is he, is he here? Is he that person here that has a very high score, and therefore we, he can be reassured on the basis of the sound that he uh, doesn't have Parkinson's. We don't know this yet. This is what we speculate, uh, speculate. And this is one of the reasons why we see people every 18 years to see, eight, sorry, 18 <laughs> months. <laughs> see them every 18 months to see what their risk is. So I hope, I hope I've convinced you. So that we are at the beginning of a very long and hard journey, but I hope that these new changes in, in, in what sleep medicine has brought into Parkinson's disease, uh, I think it's an exciting journey where we will make some, some changes, but it will take us some time. So just as I finish, I just wanted to uh, thank everyone again, so the whole clinical team, this is my imaging team, and also people in Oxford, London, uh, Papworth, and, and Oxford have been involved in, in helping with, with this project. So thank you very much.